right. Welcome once again, everyone, to the virtual meeting of the Arlington County Pedestrian Advisory Committee. It is 7.05 p.m. on December 9th, 2020. And once again, we are meeting virtually via Teams due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the states of emergency declared by the Arlington County Board and the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, we've got a long agenda in terms of number of items on it. I think it will probably be a short agenda in terms of <laughs> minutes of length, um, but hopefully that will give us plenty of time at the end um, to do, maybe do some brainstorming about what we want to talk about next year. I think we did that last December and that was very useful as we went into the new year to start planning meeting topics. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone on here knows everyone on here. Is there anyone who wants to do introductions anyway? All right. Well, we will jump <laughs> just in. just a note for anybody who joined late and, and doesn't know the the blue circle is Andrea Walker. <laughs> <laughs> It's a nice color. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's the welcome introductions and chairs report. Do we have any announcements or oh. public comments? That was your chairs report? Um, I, I guess I don't really have much to report this month with uh, oh, okay. Thanksgiving in there, not too much happened, um, <laughs> at least on, on my end. No chairs report. <laughs> Well, I'll make an announcement then. I can get some of my uh, little micro items out of the way, if that's okay. Go for it. All right. Um, the PAC has for a long time been very interested in hearing reports from Arlington County Police. And uh, folks probably mostly know that Lieutenant Dan Murphy retired recently. He had a particular interest in working on crash statistics and crunching numbers. And the new person who's in the same role, I suppose, is Lieutenant Stephen Clark. So I reached out to him uh, and said, what, what do the police think they're willing to do going forward in terms of keeping the pedestrian committee and others uh, up to speed on this? And he replied, I thought very sensibly, that they're working inside the Vision Zero program. Uh, so, I think that means that our committee's principal reporting will come from Christine Sherman uh, because she's leading the DES uh, TENO engagement with Vision Zero and she's working closely with the police. So maybe I'll read uh, Lieutenant Clark's uh, short message to me. And uh, I thought it was very sensible. You might not agree, um, but here we go. He says, um, while I understand the individual advisory committees would prefer to have a police department representative to meet to report in at the meetings, we are fully on board with having one voice under the Vision Zero umbrella to ensure a consistent message and data. Dan Murphy was a stats guy and enjoyed crunching the numbers. However, police as a group are not statisticians by trade, and I would prefer to have an actual traffic anal traffic analyst, DES be the ones crunching the numbers, reporting the results and providing recommendations all through Vision Zero. If the results show there is a need for greater or more targeted enforcement, we of course will be the branch to address that. As we move through the initial implementation phases of Vision Zero and the police department's role within the county is re redefined and molded, we may entertain returning to the individual group meetings as the law enforcement representative, but not in the reporting out role that we had taken up in the past. Thank you for the inquiry, and please let me know if I can be of assistance in any other way. We are looking forward to making Arlington as safe and as possible for all travelers. And he said I could go ahead and share that message with you all, and we are fully on board with transparency. So, so I guess I'll push back a little bit or want to focus maybe on his solution at the end there. I, I agree regarding the the data and the numbers that that's not something we necessarily need from police and police aren't the right people to give it to us. But I think even before Lieutenant Murphy was in that position, we were still having police come regularly to talk about what enforcement activities they're doing um, and, and issues of that nature. Um, so, so I think so I think he suggested at the end at some point in the future 
come in for non statistic related information, but I, I think the future is here, so to speak, and there's no reason to wait on that. Uh, okay, um, that also sounds reasonable. What do you think about uh, going, I don't want to add another layer, but what about going through Christine with that request? Because I think that would flesh out her understanding of the range of types of engagement implementation that various groups will have with the Vision Zero program. Well, but I guess my point is, I think we want to engage with the police outside of the Vision Zero program. Oh, got it, got it, okay. Yeah. And and in our last meeting when, when Christine presented, she basically said a lot of what uh, Steve is writing to you, although he's providing more details on it. So it's all consistent. And I and I think she specifically mentioned that uh, the that he would be able to come. So I think we're good from her okay. perspective. We should keep her informed. Yeah. Yeah, but no problem okay. coordinating with her, but right, Eric, right. did you have right. a comment? Yeah, I, I, I sort of sort of uh, agree with you all. I mean, right now, I think the Vision Zero program is in development, so there really isn't, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure right now, even for for sort of reporting out to the to the folks in, you know, who are participating in the, the Vision Zero development. So I think we definitely need them to come to us and, and also to talk about unique issues with pedestrians as well. So right. I, I, I would really like to see their presence, uh, you know, quarterly like they had done before, if, if it's possible for them to, to spare some time to this. Okay. And I don't know if Pam, maybe you're in a good position to do this. If you can go back to our minutes from before Lieutenant Murphy was the representative and sure. see what sort of issues we were talking to the police about. Yeah, I'll put that together. Do uh, you want me to just send it to you, send it to the group or? You want to send it to me and David, I think. Okay, I'll, I'll do that in the next couple of days. All right, um, but then I think the other follow-up from this would then be to ask Christine to come present to us on what, uh, what crashes have been like over the last 12 months because due to COVID and this change, we haven't heard anything in a long time. Right. And we never and I, got a... And we never had a final report from last year. Right. Yeah. And I think that's consistent with her role in the Vision Zero framework. Right. Um, can I add another one? Another Go for it. topic? You can do the whole meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I got two more, two more that I think are short items. Uh, there's interest from the pedestrian group in knowing about the, the dockless program, which has moved from pilot into implementation with permits and, and firms and you know fees and all that. And I reached out to ask, is there anything like a report that could be shared with the group? And I was um, told that uh, expect something next month. Uh, there, there's a process underway to review applicants for permits and there are quotas, ceilings in numbers of devices and things like that. So it's being worked out by the people whose job that is and they're going to be, uh, it's not ready for release yet. So if we can if we can wait for another month, it should be ready by next month. Sounds good. And just before we move on, Andrew, do we now have you through Teams yes. as well? Well, All right. uh, oh, can, you, then, can you turn your yeah. camera on, Andrew? Or? No. Yeah, is that I think uh, you should be able to see me. I see you now. Uh, well, you're is your video on? I don't know how it works on a phone, but you're still a oh. glowing blue circle to us. Oh. You're positively okay. glowing. But that's OK, but you can see us. That's great. Right. <laughs> and can you hear me? Yes. yes. Perfectly. OK, good. Thank you. Well, I think we're still hearing you through the phone, though, just so you know. Oh. Right. Uh, the, the last uh, of my three little uh, reports is a new effort that actually kicked off for staff back in the summer, but now it's gone public and live and it is the forestry and natural resources plan for the county. And it's being um, led by parks and they have engaged some outside consulting firms to do this and there's a an engagement page on the county's 
web empire. And if I can figure out how to share my screen, I can show you that. And if folks want to check it out, it's uh, it's a good effort. It's, it's due Friday. I'm sorry. It's due Friday. What's Comments. due Friday? The uh, you, any comments on the the plan? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I, I I think I publicized it on the on our on the Google yeah. pack. <sighs> it's great though. Yeah, I was in a meeting yesterday about this and and got a copy of the um, what they call the benchmarking report for the first time. I haven't studied it overnight. Um, well, doggone it. I've, oh, I have to open up the right. No, it's not there. Well, I don't want to take up a lot of time. Pam knows about it. It's the Arlington <laughs> County Forestry and Natural Resources Plan. And uh, it's easy to find on the county's website. It's on the Engage Arlington page. Right. There it is. Who did that? I did. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Projects.arlingtonva.us slash FNRP. And there is a um, there's a benchmarking report that I've been there you go. So that's the timeline. There's a benchmarking report. And since I'm on the the staff coordinating group, uh, we've been asked to read the benchmarking report and comment back because that's still under development. But all these other things are surveys and videos and um, it's a good effort. It's related to the public spaces master plan that was completed a year or so ago that Irina Lazy uh, was heading up. And that's it. That's for my brief little updates. Oh, and as I said in my message on the PACU group, it's an opportunity to push for better uh, street trees and, and and sidewalk landscaping and uh, trees by trails. Yes. How about on so, bridges? Anywhere. So, yeah, definitely, Tom, bridge, do it. The bridge across the Potomac. <laughs> I'm serious, actually. Yeah. And I guess I'll also just run through quickly. There's a few more engagement opportunities highlighted on the county website to make sure everyone's aware of. Uh, there's some dialogues on race and equity. There's information on police chief recruiting. Um, budget feedback is now open through January 10th. I think we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, Route 1 multimodal uh, that Pam's going to talk about a little bit later. Um, art submit the colors of Columbia Pike for transit art. They're looking for help designing the um, bus shelters for Columbia Pike. The missing middle housing study is looking for feedback through the end of December. And they've also got the phase one report for the plan the highway. Okay. Um, so as, a, as our last meeting of the calendar year, which also serves as the PAX term year, we have, I guess, some PAC business to deal with. I think everyone reported in, everyone on this call, anyone anyway reported in to David that they're interested in staying on as a member of the PAC. So the only member that we're losing will be Gail, who indicated she's moving away from the area next year. Um, we also need to hold elections for chair and vice chair. Um, we have not had anyone yet step up to indicate an interest in serving in those positions. Um, I'm willing to continue on as chair through next year, although I'd be looking to step down at the end of 2021. Do we have anyone who is interested in taking on the role of vice chair for next year and potentially chair for the year after that? Been there, done that. <laughs> All right, well, we will, I guess, have a vacancy in the vice chair position for the time yeah. being then. Oh, and, and technically, I, I'm an elected position too, so. Oh, and recording <laughs> secretary. Um, Which I want to continue to do. Right. Then I guess if someone I, wants to make a motion to elect myself as the chair and 
Pam as the recording secretary, that would be a good. This would be a good time to do that. So moved. Seconded. All right. Has been moved and seconded that I serve as the chair for the 2021 calendar year, and that Pam Pamela Van Hein serve as the recording secretary. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, Thank please you. say aye. 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 Hi. And anyone Hi. opposed or abstaining? All right. And this is just for one year, right? For one year. For both of yes. us. Okay. Yes. All right. Cool. Thank you. And then a big thank you to Chris for serving as our vice chair for the last, I think it's been the last two years, two and a half years, something like that. Right. Somewhere in there. It was fun. Yeah. It was just a rough time for me outside of not work right now. Yeah, I appreciate that and appreciate you staying on the committee for the next year. Um, I guess I think it will probably be two year appointments from the county managers. What the um, charter calls for that will. Yes, for. and Eric, since you raised that, there's a there's a form that I uh, keep, which is a roster of the members. I'd like to send that to everyone so you can check your email addresses and your phone numbers and your other engagements with other groups, so we keep that up to date. That goes to the county manager, so they have a record of everybody's contact information, and then they issue um, appointment letters. So I guess I'll send that to you, folks individually, uh, the members, but not to the general Google group. So watch watch for that on your uh, email. Yeah, I guess if you can get that out tomorrow, and if people can try and turn around that pretty quickly, if you can yes. respond back, even with a yes that everything's right, that way we can. Yes office next week before I get new appointment letters out before we, our terms expire at the end of the year. <laughs> um, the other appointments we have to deal with, um, so there's two groups that are appointed by the county board, um, but who have people representing this body. Um, so that's the Advisory Committee on Transportation Choices and the Neighborhood Complete Streets Commission. Uh, Eric Goodman has been serving as the representative of this group for the last several years on both of those. Um, I think, Eric, you indicated that you're willing to either continue on those roles or to pass them off if there's someone else who is interested. Absolutely, yes. I, I um, enjoy serving on them, but if someone else had an interest, I, I would gladly step aside. And, and I guess I'll particularly call out uh, both Lizzie and Patrick, who are our newest members. This could be a great opportunity for either of you Either of you are interested in one of those? What was the what was the first one again? There's neighborhood complete streets, and what was the second? Yes, yeah, so I guess I'll talk about both of those. Um, and Eric, jump in if I get anything wrong here. So the advisory committee on transportation choices. It's a um, joint. It's a group jointly appointed by the schools in the county um, that deals with transportation to schools. Um, and actually, John has previously served as the chair of that group as well. Um, so looking at how we can get students to schools other than having their parents drive them primarily. Um, John Eric, I'm looking at dad. Um, if you have children going to public school, it's a great committee to be on. Um, but it's, it's very interesting because it is a joint committee. So both the county and the school system are at the table. And it's pretty high visibility. So you get county board members and Dennis Leach and um, some other folks um, from APS and from staff uh, participating. So it's a good you can meet a lot of interesting folks from around the county. But particularly if you have children in the school system. Um, highly recommend it. And, and John, uh, you are not interested in going back as a, a representative again. And you had to give it up because you became the chair. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm fine. I, I, I'd be uh, if we need somebody to step up, but I don't want I might attend the meetings regardless um, <laughs> because I'm past president or past chair, but uh, uh, I didn't want to usurp Eric there. So, but I'm happy to be the PAC representative if you want. And, and then just uh, quickly, the other groups, the Neighborhood Complete Streets Commission. So the Neighborhood Complete Streets program is one of the uh, programs that does traffic common and other improvements up to our neighborhood streets, the residential streets, uh, so sidewalk constructions, intersection redesign, things of that nature. And so this um, commission serves as an advisory group to help determine which projects should get built through that program. Cool. 
So, yeah, so is there anyone, we've heard from John, heard from Eric, is there anyone else who's interested in serving on either of those groups? Um, you, you, you could attend the meeting to, to see if you were interested. I mean, they're all public meetings. So uh, any, anybody can attend and if, you know, if it appeals to you. That's true, although I think Eric's term expires at the end of the month, so ideally we would oh. choose a replacement tonight or close to tonight. I guess this is similar to John, I wouldn't want to usurp Eric. Um, if, if you'd like to continue attending, but I, I would be interested in the neighborhood complete streets. Well, I, uh, I, I don't mind uh, giving that up if you, if you would, if you would like to, to do that. It, it would be good to have someone else also to have some fresh ideas on it as well. So. Sounds good. I'll take the baton. Great. Great. And then who do we want for ACTC? Uh, what's uh, ACTC again? The, the, the school, the school group. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, was that Patrick? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Good Assuming job. you're not going to be bored with having neither of them. Right. Well, hey, uh, you know what? what? I guess I, you can be I, vice I guess, chair now. I could be vice chair. <laughs> you could put me in for, for vice chair. <laughs> there you go. It works. Are you willing? All right. <laughs> Yay. 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 Musical right. chairs. Okay, I, I nominate Eric Goodman to be uh, our new uh, vice chair and 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 incoming eventual uh, chair again. Thank you. Second. Second. I second. Aye. Yay. Aye. Done. Aye. Thank Aye. you, Eric. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. We'll, we'll have uh, two Eric G's running the committee, so we'll see how that You're welcome. <laughs> we, we, we had two David staffing it when I joined, so. Right. And two Goodmans. <laughs> yep. it's, all, it's all a plan. Oh, that's great. We're playing great. the long game here. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, that's a big relief. <laughs> that's very good. Thank you all. Um, all right, so we'll send those off to the manager's office. I guess they need to eventually make their way to the board somehow. I don't know how that works, but yeah. I don't either. The, the, the commissions are not in the manager's portfolio. I, right. I don't know how that works. Right. Yeah. Oh, do, do we have to uh, formally nominate uh, Lizzie and Patrick and vote on them, or is our discussion good enough? Uh, I'll, I'll slightly formalize this by, is there any objection to those appointments? Hearing none, it's formally nominated. So Thank you. <laughs> all, 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 we, all we can do is nominate there. <laughs> all right. Um, I'll, gonna... uh, th this is Eric. So I, I'll send each of you, uh, Lizzie and, and Patrick, I'll send you some information about each of the committees, just so you, you have a little background before you start attending. That's great. And I guess, Eric, if you could also just email the chairs of those committees and let them know that while we need the board to take action, we're attempting to nominate them. Sure, I'll do that. Yes. Right. Appreciate that. Who is the current chair of ACTC? Josh Folb. Okay. Coming, coming from the school side? Part, or, pardon me? He's a teacher at APS. He's a teacher. Oh, yeah, yeah, he is actually a teacher. He's also, or, but he's also a, par a parent, so. Okay, just not a name I knew. Thank okay. you. Okay. And who's chairing MCSC now? Um, I, you know what, it's, uh, what's her, give me a moment, I'll tell you. I just don't, I, I don't have it on my uh, thought right okay. now. All right. Anyway. It's uh, um, Elisa, and I can't remember what her last oh, name is. Yeah. yeah. Ortiz. Yes. Yes. Elisa yeah. Ortiz. Yes. She also lives near me. Um, all right. I'm going to hold off, discuss future issues to the end of our agenda. 
minutes from November, I believe, were circulated a while back. Have people had a chance to review those? Does anyone have any edits to them? I do not. <laughs> <This time. laughs> then you must have done a good job with them. Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> If there's no corrections, objections, or edits, we will deem the November minutes approved. Right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right, so the next two items we have up are the budget and the CIP, which are looking a little bit different this year due to the same reason everything is looking different this year, COVID. And actually, as we're speaking now, I think the Manager is holding a public town hall on the budget um, that is, I believe, being streamed on YouTube, so you can go back and watch it afterwards. So anyone who does that will know more than probably whatever we come up with at this meeting. Um, but my general understanding is that it will be a very tight budget year. Um, I know there's some kind of high visibility, high priority planning efforts from the board that have been getting put on hold and cut due to lack of funding and lack of staffing. Um, I saw a letter from the manager regarding that that indicated that he expected layoffs and position cuts to be coming as part of his budget proposal. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the tone I've gotten so far regarding the budget. I don't know if anyone on this call has heard anything differently. Um, this is nothing official that, that I've heard, um, but I think it's going to be a very difficult year for us to try and advocate for any sort of increased funding or new initiatives, perhaps outside some very narrow areas like Vision Zero. Um, so I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll pause there if anyone has any thoughts or comments or information that they want to share regarding the, I guess that'll be the FY 2022 budget. I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but I would extend those same sorts of comments to the CIP budget. Um, it, we get involved at staff level because me and my colleagues are all involved in various capital projects and uh, it's it's a tight year. Uh, county revenues are way down. We're doing a very short horizon capital budget instead of what has become the typical 10 year horizon for the last four or five years. It's now going to be one or two year and then it'll be revisited again soon rather than than far out in the future. And it's tightened the belt time and not a lot of space for proposing uh, new ambitious projects. We do have a lot of projects that are already in the pipeline to one extent or another. They may have some money on them. So, but it's a, it's a very active and fluid situation right now. And, and just for a little more background, I guess on the CIP. So that's ordinarily in every two year process that we would have gone through last year and we would go to next year. Um, right. So that's like COVID that we would not be dealing with the CIP this coming year, but last year's CIP was an abbreviated one because no one knew what the future was going to look like. Right. Um, so, so as I understand kind of the goal of this year's CIP is just to kind of flesh out and like what like I said, just the, the immediate term to get through the next year or two and then it'd be a, I don't know if then the CIP that follows in the next year would then go back to a more normal looking full CIP is kind of how I understood the vision. My six months ago, but I don't know what's changed right. since then. My hunch is that it may be a, a stepped return to the normal. The normal, as Eric says, was a, a two year revisiting of a 10 year plan. Um, so the idea was that the, the long term visions out there, the long term priorities are set and then a two year update with more realistic numbers and estimates. That's that's not going to happen this time and and it might not be the return in the next couple of years. It might be the re a return to a three year horizon or a four year horizon. It's, I don't even think that's settled yet. We um, uh, we in DES DOT benefit from having a really good team on the CIP now. 
a woman named Vijetha, who was hired by the county about a year ago. And she's really brings a ton of experience to this and has wrapped her and her team's awareness around all this stuff. And they're in the middle of it and they're good. So the communications are good and their uh, their controls are good. Uh, it's just a very challenging time um, for all the budget activities. So I guess maybe on that note, I, I don't know if you can maybe send an email introducing me to her. I think with the CIP, this is true for the budget as well as the CIP, but particularly true on the CIP, is it's very difficult for us to give input. It's either too early or too late, and never the yes. right time. Um, yes. so, so, I, so I don't know if particularly on the CIP, she, if there's any point in time where she thinks we could give input in a meaningful way, uh, 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 we'll definitely make room on the agenda for her whenever she thinks is appropriate time to come. That's that's a good idea. I'll do that. Great. Thank you. So uh, one thing I wanted to mention about the budget, I've been attending meetings with the Arlington Families for Safe Streets. So are you all familiar with them? Mm -hmm. um, the volunteer group and Jillian Burgess is the president now. Um, although Mike Doyle also kind of heads it up. So at their meeting last night, they were also talking about the budget and the CIP. And so they plan to send a letter to the county board and the Transportation Commission making recommendations. And they asked if I would just mention it in tonight's meeting to let the Pedestrian Advisory Committee know that they're doing this. Um, so I said I'd pass it on. Were there any particular recommendations? No, they hadn't gotten that far yet. Okay. Um, what, like we didn't get into a lot of detail on what it would be, yeah. but just that they felt they should speak up, even though they share your perception that it's a tough year but just to go on the record as advocating for something. Well, I, I agree with that. And I think uh, as usual, the PAC should send something even knowing that uh, funding is down. And when uh, Christine was talking to us last month and okay. talking about all the things for Vision Zero, there were a lot of really specific budget issues that we talked about that we thought needed to be addressed. And that could be the basis of a letter. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And even a letter saying don't cut anything is perhaps helpful as well. Right, yeah, but I mean, there were some very specific Vision Zero program related things that we would strongly support. Yes. Any I, have other? A, I have a clarifying question. Yeah. Um, Somebody able to explain to me, so the CIP is shorter this year, so usually it's 10 years, and you're saying we check in every two years. Yes. So is, is the CIP that's being talked about in this conversation, is that one of those check-ins or are we doing in, in lieu of the 10 year plan? We're saying we're not going to do that just yet. Is so it a check-in or, or the bigger one? So ordinarily every two years they do a full CIP. So it's not that every 10 years they do a big one and then a check-in every two years. It's that every two years they completely redo it, saying what they're going to do over the next 10 years. So the, the first mm -hmm. two years of that CIP basically get set in stone and then the next eight years are projections. And then when mm -hmm. two years later, they take those first two years, maybe they do the same thing, maybe they always tweak it something, maybe they tweak it a lot, maybe they tweak it a little, and that becomes the first two years of the next CIP with now another six years that shifted down and then two new years going out at the end. Um, so, so that's how it would work normally. Then this year would have been a year where they wouldn't have even done anything with the CIP. Mm -hmm. right? But because last year they couldn't even do a two-year projection, we're doing it every year right now. Mm -hmm. That's very well said from my understanding. That's better than I could have said. <laughs> it's, 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 it's magic to me. Uh, I think it might help this group to see an example of what we call the CIP worksheets, which are kind of intensive spreadsheets. And uh, I, I'll try I won't try to do it right now on the fly, but maybe by next time. And uh, imagine a spreadsheet for a project. And the project would be, uh, you know, build an intersection. And there are some cost estimating parts of the spreadsheet up at the top with with 10 columns for fiscal years. So this fiscal year, year one, we're going to spend $50,000 in planning. 
Year two, we're going to spend $50,000 in preliminary engineering. Years three and four, we're going to spend $500,000 in construction. And year five, there's going to be some closeout. So there's a, there's a, just as much as a spreadsheet. There's a section below that inflates those for future dollars. Oh, thank you very much. My, my version looks a little different like that because it's raw, it's live ammunition. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's an, another spreadsheet that takes those same numbers and assigns them to different categories of funding. So some of it comes from bonds and some comes from PAYGO and some comes from grants and some comes from a tin cup out on the sidewalk. So that, that's and, what this one is. You can see. And, and all those numbers have to add up. So it's an incredible amount of work to make all those things add up and flow and make sense because there are hundreds of projects in the CIP. So I see a little bit of it. I don't have a comprehensive view of it at all. And I think um, I think it'd be worthwhile to you know, show people a little bit under the hood about what this looks like and have Vijetha or you know, a representative who knows a lot more than I do uh, discuss it because it really is an important part of how stuff gets done. And so this is the CIP from three years ago, which was a full CIP. And so you can see it's almost 500 pages here. What they did last year was 44 pages. So right. a, a lot shorter, a lot more. I, I want to end of that. There was a lot more digestible. So I think that's something that <laughs> everyone can at least scroll through more easily. And it's, it's mostly pros and tables here rather than just piles and piles of numbers. Right. OK, because one thing I was trying to decide was whether the feedback that we will give is kind of like the yay or nay, like we should include this, we shouldn't include this. But given that it's over such a long time horizon, it seems like it's also valuable feedback or like is possible feedback to give to say, go slower on this, go faster on this, like spend more like, I don't know, dropping out over something over a longer time horizon. Um, as a way of like making it under budget. Yeah, it's like timing, another dimension. Yeah. yeah, I think timing is definitely valid feedback on the CIP, particularly whether something should be in the next two years or not has always been kind of a critical thing because the next two years actually happen. The uh, years after that are more idealistic. Right. And I, I think Lizzie's correct is that's a, a, uh, a very good way of expressing the group's sense of priorities. Um, you know, if, if, if in a normal year there's $100 to spread around and in a constrained year there's $80 to spread around, I think the group has a role to play in saying these are where we think the $80 should go. Any other thoughts on the budget or the CIP? All right, if not, I think Pam, you had some comments on Route 1? Uh, yeah, I'm listed as two things talking about the Pentagon City PDSP and uh, the Route 1. Uh, V.Route dot, dot, route 1 Multimodal Feasibility Planning Study. <laughs> some, uh, uh, I'll talk about the Pentagon City PDSP first. Uh, I, the second half of their meeting is going on right now. I'm, I'm missing it. Uh, they have, this is not a full sector plan. It's kind of a partial sector plan kind of related thing. And it's only part of Pentagon City. There's a lot of Pentagon City has already been built. Uh, but we are, of course, always planning for Amazon and some spaces where Amazon is going to be, although some of the places that Amazon is going to be are not in this plan, but never mind. Uh, they have a stakeholder group that has been doing a lot of the work on this already, and they're using consultants uh, to be a stakeholder, which did not make me happy. Uh, but they are also having public meetings, and I've been going to the public meetings. We are at a point where we are doing, hold on one second. Tonight's workshop. Uh, <clears throat> We're doing draft guiding principles and performance measures. And the first guiding principle, uh, I'm really sorry I'm not there, is better choices than driving. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is places for people. Again, it's a lot of pedestrian issues. Uh, the third is green development, having green buildings, sustainable buildings. Uh, the fourth is being inclusive and welcoming, uh, dealing with equity. And the fifth is making, uh, completing the missing links of Pentagon City, which again is a lot of pedestrian issues. So it's a lot of good stuff. Uh, walkability is a huge topic for them. Uh, so I hope to continue to be involved with it and keep you current on it. Uh, they're great workshops to participate in if you have any interest in what's going on in Pentagon City. Uh, it's open to anyone. Uh, they're very active virtual meetings and they, the consultants seem to be listening and putting things together. One of the things that we did in October was submit slides with our vision uh, for Pentagon City and I did a walkability slide which was included with the livability 22202 slides and the entire slide deck, they have something like 63 slides submitted, uh, is on the Pentagon City uh, PDSP planning site and I will post the URL for that uh, and you can check out some of these things. But it's a good project to be involved with, uh, very exciting and of course there's a lot of pressure to get this done. The other update that I wanted to give you and I need to pull it up, hold on one second, VDOT, okay. All right, this was Monday night. Uh, the second task force meeting of the VDOT Route 1 Multimodal Improvements Feasibility Study. And I am the official PAC representative on that because uh, I, I live by Route 1 <laughs> and I go under it all the time. Uh, and I really wanted to be part of this. Um, there's a lot of pressure, which I talked about in October, uh, to bring Route 1 down to grade uh, at 15th and 18th Street and there's a lot of opposition from uh, the community, especially those of us who walk and bike and like going under Route 1 on 18th. So it's still being played out. We'll see how it goes. Uh, and we are going to be having a public meeting next Wednesday and I'll, I'll give you the information and I will post it and I encourage everybody to go. Uh, this is a huge project and we really want it done right and we really want to have the voices of pedestrians there. And again, walkability is a huge issue but I'm not sure that that's really making us safe and of course we really care about that. Um, the meeting on Monday, uh, the first topic was briefly talking about the survey results from the public online survey that they did last month. Uh, they had 124 unique responders, which is a huge response rate. 45% uh, of the responders were from 22202, which is our home zip code. 13% uh, were from adjacent zip codes. So they're very happy. There was a large response rate and most of the people were people who actually lived there. 58% uh, said Route 1 is not currently easy, safe, or an effective street. <laughs> we would agree with that. Uh, pedestrian safety was the uh, highest priority on the list. You could you could rank the, they had a bunch of prior things to list and you could rank them and we came number one, which is great. Uh, also high were traffic congestion, travel time. Uh, bike safety was lower. I don't think enough bike people responded to the survey. Um, and it again verified that pedestrians avoid crossing 23rd and 20th because we think it's unsafe and if you are familiar with Route 1 you would say yes that is absolutely true. Uh, I also want to say that these results are similar to the livability 22202 uh, Route 1 working group survey that we did so it's all good and it certainly all supports how I feel about Route 1. Uh, the survey had a map uh, that you could put little markers on in comments and they had thousands of, of comments. Wow. Uh, it was really huge and they haven't really processed it all. Uh, issues were included safety, congestion, speeding, poor signal timing, not yielding pedestrians, long delays for pedestrian crossings, inadequate missing sidewalks, uh, and a need for bi-directional bike lanes and protected bike lanes, all of which we think are good, well, or things that need to be fixed rather. Uh, and they, these results will 
once they're done sorting them, they'll be on the VDOT uh, project website, and it's also going to be discussed at the public meeting next week. Uh, the VDOT staff also talked about e existing conditions. That was one of the first things that they studied with their consultants. Uh, they said vehicle operations are poor at 15, 20th, and 23rd intersections and uh, connections with I-395 northbound and 233. 233 is the route to the airport, this queer little road, uh, and yeah, those are all a mess. Um, they had a chart on, or kind of a map on safety. Uh, allegedly, they looked at some of the, the typically accessible crash data. Uh, they were only studying Route 1. They weren't doing the adjacent streets. And as we've seen from surveys that we've gotten from our police officers, uh, 222 in general is a high crash site for pedestrians, uh, although not on Route 1. We're not usually on Route 1. <laughs> um, uh, but they said, see, that crashes are falling. Um, most are at signalized intersections along Route 1. Uh, and uh, nobody's died, uh, but one third of them have ser serious injuries. So oh. the, the crashes are not quite as innocent as we might think. Uh, they also studied transit and they found that if uh, there were dedicated bus lanes, the buses went along fine. And when they had to travel in traffic, they were delayed. And uh, Fixing transit is a huge part of their project goals, so they really want to fix this. Uh, then they went into draft concepts, and basically the project is comparing existing conditions uh, to what is in the Crystal City sector plan and bringing it down to grade. And we're not going to go into why it's those three choices, but that's it. Uh, so the VDOT team is using a lot of the guidelines and criteria that are in the Crystal City sector plan, even when they're proposing bringing it down to grade. So uh, it's a 140 feet from the building edge to the building edge across the street, which is a pretty wide road, uh, but that's in the Crystal City sector. Uh, uh, they will continue to have six travel lanes uh, which many people uh, protested at the meeting. And uh, the quote unquote pedestrian zone is 20 feet, but they didn't differentiate how you split that up, which I said that they should. And then in the middle of the road is a 28 foot wide median, which actually has a lot of potential uh, to actually, you know, you could do a linear park in that, <laughs> which I suggested that that's quite wide. Uh, Let's see, what were the comments on that? And we were not expecting to hear this concept at all here. Uh, hold on one second. Sorry. Oops. Uh oh, I lost my document. <laughs> anyway, um, so. Some of my comments were that they need to define a, a minimum 10 foot clear zone on the sidewalks. And they said, well, that's in the sector plan. It's like, well, I don't care <laughs> that if you don't have a defined uh, clear zone, uh, you're going to have a cafe zone creep and everything else. And there's not going to be any room for pedestrians. And uh, I was the person who suggested doing a linear park down the median if they're going to do that. Uh, there was a lot of pushback against doing six, lane, six lanes wide, uh, and they will consider it, but they, the VDOT people think that they really need that to maintain the traffic flow. Uh, the other thing is the lanes are 11 feet wide, and people were saying, why, why does it need to be that wide? And VDOT was saying, you know, this is Route 1. It is the major national highway. You have all kinds of huge vehicles on it, a lot of traffic. They need to be 11 feet wide, so we'll see. Okay, uh, the main thing I wanted to tell you is that next week is the public meeting and I will post again on the on our Google group uh, how to get into it. I encourage you to register and attend. Uh, it's going to be discussing a lot of the things that we covered uh, 
at our meeting on Monday and we really want people to give feedback on it. And it is my job to tell you to uh, try to participate and I really hope that you do. I, I really can use your support on this. I, I feel like there's things going on among other important participants uh, that I don't know anything about. Uh, clearly, county staff are working really closely with VDOT, and that's probably a good thing. Uh, but I think there's associations with other groups uh, that we're not aware of either. So I, I really need uh, community support and the pedestrian support on this. Any questions about either of those? <laughs> what's, what's the date of the meeting? It is next Wednesday, uh, which 16. 16th. 16th. Yeah, at 6.30. Is I, just a question, is Amazon one of those other groups that you're not sure about? Probably. <laughs> uh, JBG definitely. Uh, the bid, which I'm also on, uh, certainly is an issue. And, you know, I can't, well, I mean, the whole reason that Virginia is doing this it was they agreed to do this as part of the uh, Amazon deal that they would do the feasibility study and go from there. So who knows? And apparently uh, VDOT, which I don't know the details on yet, already knows what is under Route 1. Uh, there are tunnels or metro tunnels and other things that means that they can't necessarily do some of the things they'd like to do. But I don't know the details on that yet, but apparently county staff do. <laughs> not all county staff. No, not you. <laughs> <laughs> You're not oh, one entity that shares all knowledge. <laughs> um, Pam, do, sorry, Pam, do you know who the lead consultant group is? Do you know what firm is doing this? I do. Hold on a second. Uh, yeah, so it's the main one. Uh, Kimley Horn. Kimley Horn. Right. Yeah. Uh, they're also using HDR. I'm not quite sure what HDR is, but they're active too. Uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's eight county staff on this. Uh, Dennis and Way and uh, Richard Best seem to be the most involved. Mm. They've been on the meeting so far. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, has there been any discussion of a raised median? Oh, it, it's it's a yes, it's definitely a raised median. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 thirty feet wide. <laughs> well, I know it's thirty feet wide, but but this county has been really reluctant to do raised medians for some reason, and they're they're really great. I totally agree. Uh, I mean, there obviously there will be a smooth, navigable pedestrian route across Route 1, but the actual median will be raised and we'll have trees and, and hopefully right. a nice linear park in it if they have to do it that way. Although I, I'm not convinced that they are making it really safe for cyclists and pedestrians to cross route one yet. And I, I sent them a follow up message uh, saying, well, OK, so you're interested in the linear park now. So not only do you have to get us across route one, but you've also get us to and from the linear park because we're just going to want to go to the linear park. <laughs> that sounds almost like Gateway Park. Uh, slightly. <laughs> a, a, a linear park in the middle of a big highway. Yeah. That no one can get to or from easily. Oh, oh, the existing one, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot wider, I think. And Maybe. and is very non biophilic. And I think they're they're definitely looking more biophilic. Oh, and biophilic is a big uh, it's a big yeah. desire in our neighborhood period. Uh, and it was a big part of the uh, the Pentagon City discussion. In fact, they did a whole presentation on biophilic. If you want to know what it is, that the, the first hour that I went to uh, this evening uh, was a review of the, the principles and, and the, the performance measures. And then somebody did a presentation on biophilics 
uh, stuff. So if you care about that, the whole thing was interesting to watch. I'll, I'll send a link to that too. Great. Thanks very much, Pam. Yeah. Right. Any, <laughs> any other questions or comments on that? I'll just make a comment that I've been really impressed by uh, another six lane, high, six lane highway with the uh, median on it, and that's in an urban setting, and that's West Street in Manhattan. And I, before COVID, in other words, the last part of last year and to this year, I was really amazed at how safe it is to cross it as a pedestrian and how calm the, uh, the traffic has been on it. Uh, there's no, you know, it's one of these things where they got the timing right in, in a way that didn't encourage people to speed to or to, you know, but to move on. And I was, I'll take, I'll take a look at that uh, and see if I can come up with some, some information on it because it, I'm just impressed that you can have really excellent flow and I'm talking about without tie-ups, you know, just really good flow and also have good uh, pedestrian crossing and a lot of discipline for both. Tom, what what roadway was that? West Side Highway? Yes, it West Side Highway. West yeah, Street. yeah. Pl please share that and I may share it with the VDOT people. They would be interested in that. The, the, um, ra the, raised, the raised medians that, that basically have Jersey barrier uh, uh, you know, uh, curbing are just so good in, in, in New York City, and uh, it, they would. They, there are many places here that would have been helpful. Right. Oh, I, I forgot one. I found my document again. Uh, they said that the pedestrian crossing distance is 99 feet curb to curb, and that it should take 35 to 36 seconds to cross. Does that sound realistic? It's two and a half feet per second was the last number I remember here as a standard. Okay. So that would be, so be 39 seconds. Okay. That's pretty close. Close enough. And of course the good news is you've got this humongous median hopefully in the middle uh, that will be a refuge truly for people who yeah, was important. need more time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's important stuff going on. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, did you have an update for us? Sure. So I have a couple of things that we have going on right now. And first I can report on the eight week walking challenge, which is wrapping up. Yes, on Friday. And I know Lizzie participated, Eric Goldstein participated, Pam was involved, Ian had signed up, so we had Thank you for signing up. I hope I'm not missing anybody. Uh, but anyway, people have been doing their walks 30 minutes a day for eight weeks, and they took a survey at the beginning of the program about their walking behaviors, attitudes toward walking, what mode of transportation they typically use to do certain activities, and Mobility Lab created that for us. And so now they've gone through this virtual program with us of going through the walks. Um, they get an email every week with different tips and motivational content to get them to keep walking, um, motivated primarily by health and wellness uh, goals, and also a lot of um, messaging in there about walking to run errands, walk to the grocery store if you can, walk if you're going out somewhere rather than drive. So we've mentioned that a fair bit throughout. Um, and we've also had the accountability check-ins. People can get a phone call from me every week or a text uh, just to see if they're walking and keeping up with it. And we've had this really active Facebook group and people have been sharing their walks, posting pictures and um, just having some nice exchanges with each other. And so now we'll wrap up on Friday and we have a recognition ceremony on Zoom and then um, We'll do another survey and see if people's attitudes toward walking, perceived barriers toward walking, and just in general feelings about it have changed and improved in the eight weeks of the program and if they will keep up this habit. 
if we've helped them develop a habit of walking uh, for exercise and maybe to changing their lifestyle and becoming more walkers than they have been before. So I've really enjoyed it. Uh, and I think some things I've learned from it is that at this time right now in the pandemic, people have really wanted a sense of community and connection with others. And they've really gained that through the program, through connecting with each other. And some of them, since I haven't been able to lead walks because of the pandemic, a lot of people have taken the initiative and met up with each other on their own to go walking. So that's been a really nice Thing that has happened that I wasn't really expecting. Uh, and people have been, I think, choosing to walk places to get things accomplished, places where you may have taken a short car trip, perhaps. They are walking to do these sorts of things now because they want to get in their steps and they're motivated by the health benefits. Uh, so we're most certainly going to do another challenge in the spring because we don't think we'll be back to normal with our programs. Mm -hmm. And this is a way to connect uh, meaningfully with people right now. And so based on the survey results, we'll see how we change it um, and what people will provide as feedback. So um, anyway, that's, that's that. And uh, then another thing we have going on tomorrow night, we're doing with Bike Arlington, balaclavas and baklava online. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So Katie and Evelyn are going to make a neck gaiter and a full head balaclava on Zoom. And I think as of the last we checked, we had like 44 people signed up. So we'll just see how that goes. they will demonstrate and people can make it at home. And then we got a discount from Lebanese Taverna for baklava so people can order it. <laughs> Uh, so doing that and then another event we have coming up that just came up this week together with Bike Arlington Safe Routes to School and also Jillian Burgess is involved because when these discussions started she was still chair of the Bicycle Advisory mm -hmm. Committee. We're doing a 12 days of active break uh, Zoom event on it's Thursday December 17th from 630 to 730 and the reason we're doing this is because the general feeling is that a lot of families aren't traveling for the holidays and parents are looking for things to do with their kids during this like two weeks of downtime. And so we're going to have a lot of different people speak just for a minute or less of like outdoor activities that you can do with your kids over the break um, to get them outside. So hiking, I'll, I'll talk about the Walk Arlington sidewalks, um, going for a bike ride, uh, geocaching. So just a couple different things like that. Um, so yeah, that's everything from us. Great. Well, yeah. right. Eight week challenge has been a lot of fun. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. thanks for thanks for doing it. Especially on the rainy days, I probably would not have gone out otherwise. It got me out of out out the doors and get some fresh air for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same here, actually. Um, one, any questions about the Walk Arlington update, I guess, before we move on? Uh, but that's, can you shoot it to us or, or uh, I mean, I can find it on the county schedule, but uh, it might be good to copy the membership in general. Of the uh, of the back of of the event. Oh, you mean when you mean the ones that are coming up? Yes. Oh, sure, sure. I can send them to you. Great. I have to be hit overhead two or three times sometimes. Yeah. Another yeah. another random thing I have to figure out just as an FYI, if I've been quiet on the group, all the pack emails have been going to a Gmail account I set up, not to my Walk Arlington email. So the other day, uh, I, something's weird and I need to figure it out. I was telling Katie the other day. So I went in this Gmail account and there were like all these messages. <laughs> and I thought, gee, like this group is really quiet. Like nobody ever posts. And it's because they haven't been going to my correct mailbox. 
Right. And Katie said that happened to you once, David. Or yes, it has happened repeatedly to me. Uh, <laughs> so I need to figure out how to fix that because um, I've been missing a lot. <laughs> So but yes, I won't email everybody. Mary, since you brought it up, I'm completely stupid about this stuff. I think I'm registered as a manager of the Google group. I'm not managing a damn thing. <laughs> I, I barely managed to log in. <laughs> who, who actually controls the, the, if there is such a thing as a master list? Uh, huh? Because my, my connection to the Google group is all messed up. I can post to it but the, the responses from it go into the ether somewhere. I also have a, a Gmail account that I don't use regularly. I go to it every six months and there's all the Viagra right. ads and everything. And <laughs> I, I could use some help. And I, so, so I think I, the issue is because you're the moderator of it, yeah, you need idea. a Gmail account associated with it. And so, it's pro so that's probably why, David, you've been having the issues. Okay. Um, I'm looking to see, I think, yeah, so it's me, Chris, Pam, and you, David, who are currently marked as owners of that group. I, it, I, I, my, my frustration with this has gotten to the point that I should probably just get out and then request to be readmitted. I've done that a couple of times. It's never been right. So, so I, I feel like you've I'm, now told Google to associate your Gmail address with your Arlington VA address. Well, and that was probably a mistake. Um, I think for the for the purposes of the PAC Google group, I should be registered with the Arlington email address. Right. But Google, you know, Google wants to control the world, and they're trying to force me into a single identity every time I look at a map or a photograph or everything. I don't like that. That's not the place to really complain, complain about that. I want to have a better relationship with the PAC Google group, but I could use a hand doing that. Does David need to be a manager? Would no. that help if he's I, not I, a manager? Well, I thought we thought it was good for a county employee to oh. have some control over oh, the group. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that. <laughs> True. Yeah, some, some level of oversight or approval or, um, you know, admission control. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to be a very passive manager. I just, yeah. I, I, I don't have the correct relationship with the Google group at this point. Um, Eric uh, Goldstein, can you help me with that if we do that privately? I can. Uh, as of about three hours ago, my phone no longer works. So uh, the next day or two will not be a good time to do that. But yeah, maybe sometime next week. Okay, that'd be great. I'd like yes. to get that clean. And the same with you, Mary. Yeah, yeah, whatever's going on with me, I might end up uh, subscribing again. I need to figure it out. But yeah. yes, if you get any requests from me, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to get in from the correct mailbox. Okay. Perfect. Well, I, I will pin my hopes on figuring this out in the near future with Eric's help. Sounds like a plan. Good. And I guess we need to get Eric Goodman as a administrator in the group once again. Okay. I, I think I'm I'm still an administrator. I don't know that I ever lost my rights. I, I think we took them away from you a year or so ago. <laughs> <laughs> you were you were demoted. Although it does look like David Goodman might still be a manager, so we need to maybe deal with that one. Yeah, we could probably we could probably demote David. That would be okay. What we don't want to do is what David accidentally did a couple of years ago, which is accidentally delete a whole bunch of people. <laughs> so make changes carefully, please. <laughs> All right. Um, the last update I have, I just remembered about maybe e either David or Leah, you can chime in on this one. So I go across the bicycle advisor group email list is that the um, Transportation Planning Board has some sort of advisory group that they're looking for members on. Do either of you, I think Leah, maybe you'd send out an email about that? Uh, Leah? I see Leah's icon there, but I haven't heard from her directly. 
Sorry, I, I still know. struggle with the uh, unmuting ah. even months later. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, so let me, that was the, it's essentially a community advisory board to the transportation planning board. Let me actually just pull up that email and I can just read that really quick. It's probably the best way to do it. Let's see here. Sorry for the way I'm just pulling this up. Okay, here it is. So this is it's the CAC, it's the Community Advisory Committee for the Transportation Planning Board. And like I said, it's essentially a public feedback function for the TPB. Um, Dan, who passed along, said the time commitment would be a couple of hours once a month. And then I believe in the email passed along a little bit more about the Transportation Planning Board, then also the application. This would be for 2021, just to clarify. Great. Okay. The Transportation yep. Planning Board is a, that's an MCOG group, so the Metropolitan Council on Governments. So that's a regional group made up of the governments of DC and then the cities and counties in Maryland and Virginia and the area. And so they've got a number of subsidiary groups, one of which it does transportation planning. So we can try and get that email across on the email list. And so if anyone's interested, it would not be as a committee representative, but in your individual capacity, you may be interested in joining that. Um, we had a number of items at the end of the agenda, just it. I don't know if there's updates on any of those topics from any members, Lee Highway, Neighborhood Complete Streets, Vision Zero, Clarendon Sector Plan, Pershing Drive, Schools, um, we are talking about Dockless, or any of those topics. Uh, I think we have people who might be representatives to various groups dealing with those issues. Anyone want to give an update on any of those topics or any other topics that you represent the PAC to? I'll just clarify the, the dockless thing. I put that item on the agenda and then learned today that they're not ready to uh, say anything until next month. So Fair enough. disregard that. Jim? The, um, the, the long range planning committee study group of the general land use plan for the <laughs> site of the days in, we, we had a meeting yesterday it's still so preliminary that there's really, uh, there's not much to say about it. We'll have plenty of time to weigh in. The one thought I did have, however, was that, and, and this could be, as you well know, this could be two years down the road. When the developer submits a plan and the site plan review committee accepts it or, or begins to review it, we should probably, we might want to have somebody on that committee. I think we've got plenty. We got plenty of time to think about that. I think we generally have someone on each of the site plan review. Yeah, that's Lord Zee Pam or Ian primarily. Yeah, Ian's been uh, covering days in already. Uh, early, so yeah, he he will probably be it. He's not here, so of course he's going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm yeah, on the that, study group. Might be good. Yeah. If, Jim, it might be good if you want to touch base with Ian just to the extent you're sure. both dealing with the same site that are in going through two different processes at the same time. Yeah, I don't think he was there last night, but um, I'll check. Yeah, no, I, th I think there might be a parallel something else going on for the same yeah. site. Right. Well, it's so preliminary. It's very, it's so early that we got plenty of time. Anyone else? I could talk just briefly about neighborhood complete streets. I mean, okay. Um, I believe at the last meeting, and it was it was last month, uh, they kind of went over the accomplishments that they've done, uh, you know, kind of looking back at some of the pilot projects that they've done. And then I believe there are a couple 
projects that are funded to be completed that uh, I not sure where they are in terms of when they're actually going to be constructed, but there, there are two of them out there. And then um, there were some final, uh, they finalized some some changes uh, to the um, select, uh, the, the criteria, the point scoring criteria uh, for um, uh, scoring pro uh, projects. And uh, I guess at this point, um, they don't, they're not going to put out a big sort of call for projects, but they are taking in new projects and, and looking at them and they will score them as they as they come in. But they don't have a lot of don't have a lot of funds for, for projects. So maybe down the road just, you know, two or three a year or something like that. because um, they, they don't have a, a big budget at this point. I think that might be something with the CIP that we want to advocate that it's not big budget doesn't get any smaller. Absolutely. Uh, right. I can add a little bit of uh, local detail to the neighborhood complete streets uh, that Eric just reported on. The, the idea of reallocating space in the county during COVID time for different activities is still alive. Um, we heard a report from Dennis Leach about how challenging it is because of staffing issues and it's expensive to buy orange cones and all those kinds of things. But the, the, our colleagues in TENO are still looking for places where changes might be made. Their, their, preference is, their preference is to make permanent changes rather than a whole bunch of temporary changes. And they're looking to the screening process that the Neighborhood Complete Streets program did, mm. uh, uh, my colleague Michelle Stafford, because they had hundreds of proposed project ideas that, that citizens proposed a couple of years ago. And they wound up with a very short list of two or three things that got funded and a very, very short list of a couple of pilots that got executed. So all of that effort and all of that community input and all that sorting and sifting and scoring was not lost effort. Uh, it's going to take a lot of time to, you know, build projects through a through a sparsely funded complete streets program, but it's the most complete sort of screening of suggested locations that's been done in a, in a long time. So uh, you might want to keep your eyes peeled for I don't know how it's going to play out, but there's still movement afoot to do COVID responsive changes in the right of way and the complete streets screening will feed will be uh, consulted in in anything along those lines. Great. Eric, I, I might add uh, my own. Yeah. I might add that uh, we could use this time to do a, a, a Stafford Street survey that, I mean, I think is very successful. Uh, time of COVID is a strange time, but to, to, to do a follow up on, on what was completed, uh, you know, so what do we have? Maybe five months or something before COVID that we had experience with it. Anyway, I think it's very successful. And uh, it'd be good to use uh, to advertise uh, uh, to encourage, you know, for that uh, the process to have. I think it's a winner, and we ought to we ought to crow about it. I live on Stafford Street. <laughs> well, I guess our new neighborhood complete streets commission representative can take that up at the next commission meeting. <laughs> Any other comments on complete streets? Okay. Mary, I think you had something on something else. Yeah, just a quick one on schools because I've been attending those meetings. So the hope has been that everyone or the, the next level of students like the younger elementary students would be back in January and no one feels at all sure that that will happen. 
Um, so it's still kind of on hold and we're ready with Safe Routes to School and Bike Arlington to do some parental education when the time comes about bike trains and walking school buses and encouraging walking and biking. Uh, but we just don't know yet when it will be. So everybody's still waiting, uh, which it's probably obvious that we wouldn't know yet. But anyway, that's the latest from there. Thanks. Anyone else? All right, if not, this is a good time to switch to doing some planning for the upcoming year. Um, so let me share my screen here. I just wanted to brainstorm through ideas of speakers and conversations and topics we want to deal with over the coming year. I've pre-filled it with some thoughts that I had prior to tonight as well as things that come up on today's call. Um, so we, we mentioned a couple of times the dockless scooters. Um, we talked about police, the CIP, I'll add in the operating budget there. Um, so we heard, I guess it was maybe two or three months ago now um, from, from someone in uh, water sewer streets about uh, the sidewalk inventory, but it, I, I think we, we went on that call. There's a lot going on with sidewalk maintenance that we don't understand. And given that that's staffed outside of DOT, we don't necessarily have the ongoing visibility to. So I thought it would be good to have uh, that gentleman come back, talk to us, um, as well as just kind of a refresher orientation for newer people on kind of how the county is organized, in particular how the Department of Environmental Services and the Division of Transportation within DENS are organized a who's who sort of orientation. Um, are there, or I think probably there's pretty strong agreement those are all things worth doing. If someone disagrees, please let me know and want to open it up for other thoughts on topics people want to hear about and talk about. Hi. Construction. <laughs> yes, it's been a while. Um, can I mention something specific in, in the uh, bicycle advisory committee uh, on Monday, they were talking about really bike related facilities associated with uh, um, connections to, to national airport. Um, but I think maybe even look at the pedestrian side as well in terms of what's what's happening. Yeah, we were one of the early supporters of the Crystal City to DCA bridge or tunnel or whatever it turns out that it will be. I think one one thing there to keep an eye on is uh, in the near future, there should be uh, the announcement of a consultant selection to run the NEPA study for that potential project. Oh. Even, even getting to the point of being able to hire somebody to do that work has taken a year. <laughs> Anything else? So I'm, I'm sure there's other things. What else do people have? Oh, uh, do we want to talk about updating the pedestrian element that came up with the Vision Zero discussion with Christine and how we wanted to try to put something together perhaps before they tried to meld everything together and we couldn't really update it anymore? Yeah, and I think that probably needs to wait until we get this action plan from Vision Zero. Um, And of course, vision zero. Right. <laughs> we want to stay on top of. Um, I guess one that's still kind of uh, we'd like to find out where that goes is just safe passage through uh, construction construction zones, which. Yeah, uh, here. Oh, I'm sorry. You had a. I wasn't even looking. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I interrupted you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, 
What else do we got? One thing that's come up, um, I think in a few meetings this year, is kind of the um, at times ambiguous relationship of our group to the county manager. And kind of, um, I think one way it was described, maybe at like our, I don't know, maybe August meeting was like, it sometimes feels like the, the feedback goes one direction. Um, so like we give feedback um, to other groups, but there's uh, rarely like, I guess like requests for feedback or like requests for input. Um, and so I think it might be worth I don't know if this is a discussion or like something that happens outside of this meeting, just kind of figuring out how can we be um, more helpful in our advisory capacity. Yeah, I think that probably happens outside the meeting, but yeah, I think it is something that the county maybe the manager or staff needs to be filling in this list for us in a lot of ways. Hey, Eric. Um, yeah. This is John. You know, I don't know how how we sort of categorize this topic, but you know, I'm curious who we could talk to at the county or just kind of hear about. Um, I feel like when for us to see improvements to the kind of the built environment or the pedestrian realm, it feels like it's sort of it's all or nothing. Meaning, um, there are a lot of sites near where I live where ultimately. We'll, we'll see a nice big sidewalk in front of a brand new, a redeveloped site. And But until then, you could have just a disastrous sidewalk. And there doesn't seem to be an in-between. And I'm, I'm curious if if there are tools that the county can leverage, you know, it's sort of around tactical urbanism, but sort of intermediate um, treatments to provide safer passage or more comfortable passage um, rather than having to wait years and years until a site is fully redeveloped, um, if that makes sense. I'd be interested in hearing somebody from from the county to kind of understand a little bit more about that, or if they do have sites that they've sort of treated while they're waiting for um, a complete um, redevelopment. Yeah, I mean, I think there's probably some answers to that. There's, I know, the, the Walk Arlington funding, but I, I don't know that there's a great answer or we'll ever get a great answer but it's certainly worth talking about. I, I feel like the I think it's a big topic huge topic um, I think folks in the meeting are probably aware that the principle the two principal ways that sidewalks get built are either through redevelopment or through neighborhood conservation program neighborhood conservation is getting a big rethink uh, I'm not party to those discussions. I don't know if anybody on the PAC is party to those discussions. And it, you're absolutely right, John. It's kind of like feast or famine on sidewalks. It's either nothing or you get a very nice new facility in front of a million dollar, hundred million dollar building. And if I might be so bold as to say there's something similar in like bike parking, is that bike parking can show up either as a a brand new facility at a metro station that costs thirty thousand dollars and parks forty bikes, or it's a U rack inserted in a sidewalk somewhere that is really difficult to pull off because we're not set up to do it. And the co the commonality is that Arlington prides itself on being walk friendly and bike friendly, and can't do some of the basic stuff very well doesn't mean it's impossible, it just means it's hard and all the bureaucratic mechanisms are not set up to make it easy. And I think it goes to a sense of priorities and, you know, sometimes big organizations like to pull big levers and have big results. And it's sometimes hard to do really little stuff. So to, to you know, I mean, Jim Feaster could probably go on for a long time about how hard it is to build sidewalks through neighborhood conservation. And it's, I mean, neighborhood, neighborhood, neighborhood complete streets, the whole program is founded somewhat in response to how difficult it is to build sidewalks through those two traditional modes. And we're, we're not there yet. We're not out the other end of that. So it's, a, it's certainly a conversation worth returning to. Chris, did you have something you want to add on that? Yeah, and I mean, Mike, to focus in on that 
a specific problem I have in there is like sidewalk conditions and like mid to end of life or even just like midlife or older site plan buildings because a lot of times when sidewalks are broken you bring up with the county and they say well it's the owner operator of that block or that section of sidewalk but then there seems to be no real incentive or enforcement mechanism for the county to actually enforce its own site plan conditions I think that's really something I know, I, I know that the, the I think the people having that conversation more broadly than just sidewalks and transportation, how we make sure that what the developers are promising that they do actually gets done. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 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 so I think there is probably room for movement on that, whether that, that aspect of it in particular. I want to say this list that, that you're compiling right now is really good for me to take to my colleagues to explain the breadth of what this group's interested in. I think it's a very good, uh, uh, it's a it's a good product. And now I'm gonna add equity to this list, something we've mm -hmm. talked about a few times in the past. Yep. Jim? Uh, just just a, a comment. I think that uh, one of the things that the Neighborhood Conservation Advisory Program is, is limited to uh, neighborhood streets, not the, uh, not the main streets or where right. a development would take care of. Nevertheless, and, and I think frankly, uh, David's absolutely right. The complete streets program was was developed uh, in a, in response to deal with some of those uh, areas that um, the, the neighborhood should not be voting on. <laughs> and I think I would I would just say that I believe there are streets and there are intersections in the county that need to be fixed or implemented that are, whose importance exceeds the residents who live along those streets. In other words, I think that there are places where the neighborhoods should not be voting. Right. <laughs> this is something that we all own and, and all of the, uh, and it belongs to the entire county and it should not reside with a vote by the property owners. Mm -hmm. This is Eric Goodman. Um, one other uh, thing I, w I was thinking that maybe staff can go back and look at what sort of projects, corridors, or things are sort of upcoming that we can sort of get into looking at early on, sort of like the Columbia Pike improvements or the Clarendon Circle, Washington Boulevard improvements, things of those sorts. Yeah, I mean, I think right, right now, kind of Pentagon City area is getting a lot of the attention. I don't have any inkling of kind of what's next after that. I don't know if anyone else no, has Lee heard highway, any rumors. The highway is coming online. Yeah, I, I guess. The, I had, you know, I had the experience of, of being involved, uh, very much involved with the, the, Lee, the Cherrydale section, which is probably the only place in the county where the county took on uh, uh, the responsibility for designing and building uh, a complete underground uh, grounding of, of utilities and uh, you know electrical utilities and building sidewalk for the, the whole of the project they didn't wait on individual site plans to get it done they actually did it now, I, now that's that's the first and the last time that they've done that, right. uh, but it was but it was very very much appreciated, and I don't know uh, uh, there will be sections of you know Lee Highway is going to be uh, a string of of neighborhoods not necessarily touching each other of, of little you know commercial areas and, and, and higher housing areas and it might be that. Bill, the county will, uh, the county could get involved in doing complete sections uh, oh, in gosh. that case, uh, which is, I mean, it's a big nut, but uh, uh, there, it, it, it's not unprecedented. The, the other thing I might add by just thinking off the top of my head is that this bike thing, that's interesting that, I mean, I, the, the business of your, of, you said bike racks. Well, you can, 
you can get bike racks built quite easily and uh, ingeniously uh, by a uh, let's you know by a contest <laughs> uh, by uh, by as an art project. There there are other avenues to doing it, and I guess you can put temporary on it or whatever. But there 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 are ways of getting things done uh, that are very desirable will produce desirable and and homemade. Uh, uh, or you know, attractive results um, that you don't have to wait for the county program and the million dollar bike rack. Uh, that's who that falls under. I don't know, but uh, uh, I get yeah. a million. So, so I think that all falls under the how to do things more quickly. Yep. Yeah. Andrew or Patrick, I don't think we've heard from either of you. I like everything that you've been saying. Great. Yeah, this is Patrick. I, I uh, concur with uh, most of what's uh, on here. Uh, basically, uh, uh, a lot of it's related to uh, the budget, transportation, uh, pedestrian equity, like we discussed. So I, I agree with most of what's on here already. Great. There's one thing I, that I was involved with a couple of times, and that was the uh, the bike pedestrian bridge that's going to go in with the railway bridge that's being built. And the last thing I had to do with it back in the fall sometime when they were crossing some sort of budget threshold or something, commitment to the railroad part of it. And that's they're putting this bridge, which is very much the, a, a separate uh, bicycle bridge in between to the railway bridge and one of the 14th Street bridges, rather than, you know, out of the noise and stuff, but putting it just below, you know, to south of the uh, downriver from the last, from the railway bridge, that's the last bridge. And it would it'd be so much better it was so much better for users to have that thing in, in clear space, but not just the view down river and so forth. And uh, I've, I've made the point a couple of times without uh, putting much homework in it. Um, and there are reasons why that would be more difficult, but but not insurmountable and not that difficult. And, and I just, I, I don't know where the bicycle committee is on this thing. I think they're basically they're thrilled to have a bridge. Um, but um, uh, I, it's it's also a it's also a good um, pedestrian facility and could be more than transit. It could be hangout space and stuff there. It's, it's a great opportunity to do it right. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think at this point we'll have to be happy with any crossing there is mm. my perspective. But Perhaps we can revisit that. Pam? Uh, hi, uh, a couple comments on Longbridge. Uh, and I think it's a done deal. It is It's going to be what it's going to be. And one of the problems, if I recall, was the landing on the DC side, that if you move the bridge to the south side, uh, there was no place to put it on on the DC side. Uh, I attended, or actually I, I watched the uh, Northern Virginia Joint Transportation meeting last night, which was fascinating. Uh, I, I highly recommend it. <laughs> it's like an hour. Uh, it's a great update of uh, how all these different uh, Virginia transportation organizations work and what they do. A lot of stuff on rail work. But they said for Longbridge uh, that Virginia is actually close to figuring out how to pay for it. Have you heard about that, uh, David? Yes, um, not any kind of detail, but the, the the last I heard was about a year ago. Um, the Governor Northam came to Crystal City and made an announcement that the Longbridge funding would be wrapped into a $6 billion state of Virginia funding package for rail improvements. And the, the bike pad span over the Potomac was was folded into that. And I actually found the um, con the Congressional Act that Senator Warner wrote up 
that mention, I, I mean, I'm reading a, an act of Congress that says bicycle pedestrian bridge over the Potomac. I just about dropped my breakfast. Uh, <laughs> it was great to see. So I, I got all excited about a year ago. I think it was last November, a year ago, uh, this meeting at uh, Crystal City where the governor announced that uh, Virginia was going into a kind of partnership with Amtrak and the the CEO of Amtrak was in the room and it was it was you know more suits than I'm used to dealing being around and it was all very exciting and I was told by my colleagues to kind of relax because we were there we had what we'd been pushing for um, maybe not in all the design details like what what Tom said was correct that there was a lot of interest in having a, a beautiful, clear pedestrian experience or bicycle pedestrian experience on a bridge that was not hemmed in on both sides by other bridges. It just couldn't be pulled off when, you know, the, the serious consultant types who do all the engineering and the planning, it, they went through a very strict kind of um, we, winnowing process to get down to what was actually feasible. What Pam says about the DC side of the bridge is much more complicated than the Arlington side. On the Arlington side, we offer them a park. They're going to land in a park behind an aquatic center. It's pretty much home free. The DC side is incredibly challenging. There's all sorts of federal properties mm -hmm. and bridges and waterways and important structures and private landowners. It's really, really incredibly difficult on the DC side. So I was I was really involved a couple of years ago and helped craft the county's letter to the, the Long Bridge EIS process. And I think we were really, really successful. We're sitting in a really good place okay. for the bridge for the moment. And, and according to the meeting last night, uh, it sounds like that Virginia has really figured out how they're going to pay for it. Yeah, and that I don't know. That don't was know a recent, a fairly recent decision, apparently. I don't know whether it's going to be bonds or whether they're. I don't know how that what that looks like. I'll I'll go look for some information about that. It was not well, simple. <laughs> I, I walked out of one of the one of those meetings, a uh, big big meeting, and um, the same suits and everything else, and um, yeah, some the, one guy was saying who was one of the suit guys. That Amtrak had all the money in the world they need to break, and don't worry about the money. Yeah, right. yeah, and it does look like the environmental impact study got signed off on over the summer as well. Yeah. Right, right. I right. mean, the the arguments were compelling. I mean, it, it, it wasn't just Arlington. Lots of citizens and groups like Waba and and rail riders. They said. You're going to you're going to spend a billion dollars to bring a build a bridge. You've got to do it right. You've got to do it right. You've got to accommodate all the uses that want to use that want to make that crossing. And it, it was a compelling set of arguments. Okay. Any other topics people want to add to the list? I guess just a general, very broad topic, um, but zoning. Um, I know there's a couple things that have kicked off, um, like the missing middle um, study. There's something about like um, around metro stations. I, I don't know exactly what that one is, um, but I do think it is something that is at least tangential to um, to pedestrians um, because people won't really, you know, it's not if you don't have anywhere useful to walk, um, why would you be walking? Um, so I think it is something that we have a vested interest in. Um, I don't know what we would talk about with this, but yeah, I, I mean, it's I, to keep in mind. I mean, I, I see those going on, and I, I, I know there's probably some way to make them relevant, but I always struggle with exactly what the tie into the pedestrian infrastructure is, and those tend to be more hot button issues. That if there isn't the clear pedestrian tie in, I, I tend to shy away from, but perhaps I shouldn't be. Um, I certainly think how we use our zoning to create um, places that people want to, places that people want to walk is a very valid topic. For um, expanding on that just a little bit, I'm certainly no authority on zoning, but in the weeds of zoning 
requirements and descriptions are things like defined dimensions of things. So, uh, you know, there could be parts of the county that are defined where, the, where a 16 foot wide sidewalk is a default or a five foot wide sidewalk. It really gets very, very detailed. And it strikes me as important. I live in Northwest DC and right across the line in Bethesda, there's a huge building boom going on. I mean, there's, they're building 18 story buildings on, you know, Wisconsin Avenue where there never were more than two story buildings before. And I don't know, I know Montgomery County less than I know DC and I know the DC code less than Arlington. I don't know how they're adopting that to uh, make a, a good experience on the ground. I don't know what kind of zoning discussions have preceded the appearance of these gigantic new buildings in downtown Bethesda. Yeah, and I guess related to that, we, we, we started, I guess, in early 2019, some conversations, uh, particularly around sidewalk cafes, about, about clear zones that right. uh, kind right. of got stuck in a black hole somewhere that I should probably revive. Right. And, and again, I, that's one of the reasons why I think it's really important to update the pedestrian element is if we have a guideline uh, that's been supported by the board, we can really go to these SPRC meetings and say, this is what we say, this is what is in the guidelines, you need to do this. You know, Ian and I are constantly fighting to get wider sidewalks everywhere. <laughs> and they say, no, 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 it's not in the guidelines. <laughs> and, and, and one thing on that, that what I never got the good answer for, and it sounds like there isn't a good answer that I'll throw back on you, David, is when it's up to planners' judgments or engineering judgment on what is needed, there does not seem to be any sort of gui guidance on that judgment. I mean, you, you can take a road, and I think an engineer can tell you exactly how they're going to figure out what the safe speed limit for that road is. I don't think there's any way other than shrugging your shoulders to say, how big of a sidewalk do you need here? Um, and, and so I think even even if it's not, we need 10 feet clear on these roads, I think something more, there's something in the middle there as well. Leah? Yeah, so I can just touch on that briefly because I do a lot of the site developments and it is hard because sometimes I'll reference AASHTO and NACTO standards, but those aren't necessarily adopted by the county. Um, but we did have a meeting the other day with transportation engineering and operations and planning and parks to figure out how we can almost make a toolbox to reference for site developments. So this is for biking and pet infrastructure. So this is something we'll likely come to you for. Um, but that is something we're working on to empower planners or whoever's doing the site review to actually reference a very concrete, you know, standard so that developers do have to do something in a certain way. Good. That's glad terrific. To, glad to hear progress has <laughs> been made on that. There, there's some history there. Let, let me have one minute for a little bit of a history uh, perspective on that. Is that transportation money, to the extent that it flows from the federal government out, has typically gone through state DOTs. And, and in that world, Virginia's state DOT is an oddball because it's really, really large. And state DOTs don't typically pay a lot of attention to the pedestrian realm. And countless Virginia highways run through our main streets, through towns. And the, um, the organization NACTO in the last decade or so has come into that um, relatively unpopulated space and develop really, really good guidance for how to do sidewalks and bike facilities in built up areas. Um, so it's a real advance in the whole field of urban design, paying attention to bike and ped transportation. And, and uh, Leah is absolutely right that uh, Arlington's getting on board with that. Excellent. Patrick? Um, um, uh, Yes. So in terms of like uh, the, I have a question about the DC, uh, DCA access NEPA study. Um, I guess my question on that is, um, is it related to uh, 
creating bi uh, walking and bike paths and what the impacts are to the surrounding community environmentally or how, what's the uh, what, what's the NEPA study in relation to uh, the charge of this uh, group in particular? OK, I can answer that. First, announcing that my my little laptop computer here is really low on battery, so I'll talk fast. <laughs> There's a the the NEPA study that I referenced earlier is related to the proposal to create a new connection between Crystal City, Crystal Drive, and DC uh, DCA National Airport. It was first proposed by the bid, Crystal City bid, mm -hmm. and when it was Crystal City bid, and uh, with the cooperation and of JBG Smith, which is a huge uh, property owner there. And it, the original proposal is very flashy and looks great. It's a great idea. It's a great idea to have a pedestrian connection, principally pedestrian connection between Crystal Drive, which is essentially a, a downtown and an important airport. There's very few locations in this country that have such a thing, maybe, maybe not. Um, and there, it's a it's a sticky wicket because there's some real important neighbors there. Principal among them being the National Park Service, which runs a scenic parkway right through the middle of this uh, division between the downtown of Crystal City and the airport of DCA. So the NEPA study uh, will be a comprehensive look at everything that's involved in this proposed connection. And it has to be agnostic to what the solution would be going in. So it's not a tunnel, it's not a bridge, it's not a gondola, it's a connection. It's undefined at the beginning. And then through a process of looking at environmental constraints and looking at underground archaeology and looking at the, the passenger rail line there, and looking at the airport, blah, 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 blah. This is a two or three year long process that will undertake to understand all of that, listen to all the stakeholders, and come out with some recommendations. So the, there's funds. There are funds that are coming through the state that are ultimately federal funds. I think the bulk of them are from a program called CMAC, which is Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality. Arlington has over many, many years, made use of a lot of CMAC money. And it follows a playbook, a very strict federal standard for how you do this kind of a study. And it's taken, like I said, a year or so to get to the point of selecting a consultant firm to do that work. There are firms who do this. If you you can go to the Long Bridge project, which was a, a big NEPA EIS study done very well, very professionally, took a long time. It's that kind of thing, not as extensive because it's not going to be a billion dollar project. It's going to be a 30 or 40 or 50 million dollar project. They they include things like a public engagement and interagency coordination plan. And that alone is a 40 page document that just documents, documents all the correspondence back and forth. So we're getting to the starting gun of the NEPA study for this multimodal connection. And that's about as much as I can say about that. I guess the one piece I'll add to the story there is as part of the uh, package for getting Amazon included some yes. assurances that this would move forward. And so that's really right. the impetus that moved this from a idea to something that has a good chance of actually happening. That's absolutely right. And so that that greased the skids for the state of Virginia putting up some millions of dollars to study this. It was a promise to the big uh, commercial uh, tenant that they landed. What I miss <laughs> It is a little more forceful backing of this idea coming from the state. I mean, I think it'd make a difference for the governor to talk to the senators, to talk to the park service, to the new interior secretary, whatever. But now I'm starting to riff a little too freely. Okay. Well, we are running out of time here, so I'll put in one last call for 
suggestions to add to this list. If you think of something after tonight, feel free to email me about it as well. Hearing nothing else, do we have anything else we want to cover before adjourning? Uh, this is Eric. Um, if I if I could have uh, Lizzie and Patrick uh, email me just so I get their email address and then I can send them information about uh, the two uh, committees. Um, my email is, uh, you can just send it to uh, ericdgoodman at mac.com. It's ericdgoodman at mac.com. And I think what David sends out tomorrow will have everyone's email address for everyone. Okay. Yes, I'm going to I'm going to send out a roster. It's a little spreadsheet sure. with uh, that sort of information. You can use it to communicate with each other. Uh, Good. And I just didn't want to send it to the whole Google group. So that's a little too right. open ended. Right. Are you going to send your picture with uh, the red T-shirt? <laughs> Anyone else have anything? All right. If not, thanks everyone for coming. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Thanks to Eric for stepping up to be the vice chair for next yes. year. And Thank you everybody for stepping year. up. And I will see everyone in January. Yes, thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks all. Bye -bye. Take care. Happy New Bye. Year, everybody. Happy, Happy New, New Year. year.